question that I'm sure we all have been waiting for as eagerly as I am. The topic for this session is going to be Sikh diaspora across the globe, sharing culture and heritage with roots, conversation on documenting diaspora and history through books and films. The guests that I would like to invite for the same are Karen Dosanj and Swaran Singh Khan. Karen Dosanj is the author of Untold Stories, The South Asian Pioneer Experience in British Columbia, curator of Sikh Lens production film, Hidden Histories, The Sikh Migration Path to Canada. Swaran Singh Kalu is a veteran researcher and author of several books on Sikh migration to non-English speaking countries in continental Europe, Latin America and Asia Pacific. All right, everybody, let us begin with the session. She has done a tremendous work on British Columbia. She has actually titled her book Southeast Asians and not Sikhs, but majority of the conversation is about the Sikhs. Um, she is background wise a corporate executive and uh, is known for promotion and communication. So far as promotion is concerned, I vouch for it from the viewpoint, from a distance, because the pre-launch that they had, she, has, uh, she was able to invite lots of uh, people of high ranking, including Sanj, who was the premier, including uh, Dhaliwal, uh, and uh, of course, the defense minister. So far as the communication is concerned, her book, I'm fascinated because it is full of documents. Very few researchers put so many documents as she has done and very well documented. Before I come to six in Canada, six in British Columbia, I, I had read about it, I learned about it, but I'm shocked of the way the treatment of six was in Canada. In fact, it is totally contradictory to some of the things that I will be talking a little bit briefly touching on it. Indian Sikh migration started with the British only. In 1850s, after Maharaja Ranjit Singh Punjab got annexed by the British in 1849, in 1850s, the first Sikh soldiers were taken to China and Burma for the Opium War as well as for the Anglo-Burma uh, Anglo War. So the history started much earlier than it took place in Canada. And also the British supported Sikhs, encouraged Sikhs to migrate in various forms and they wanted them to keep turban and hair. And they wanted to set up Gurdwaras. They encouraged, in fact the first Gurdwara outside India was set up in Yangon, Rangoon, Burma. And that foundation stone was laid by the British chief of police. Second Gurdwara was set up in Malaysia, where the head of the army was in the procession in front of the Guru Granth Sahib. So it is very surprising to note that in Canada, there was a discrimination against the Sikhs. Maybe. When I think about it, it is that the white British Commonwealth countries, they had a different attitude towards the Sikhs and towards the Indians than in the case of Africa, Asia. In fact, two-thirds of migration till 1947 was in Asian and African countries, not in the West. After partition, after independence, no major, two-third majority is going to Western countries. So totally different scenario has taken place. So I was shocked to see, read her book, where I knew about it, discrimination, but I did not realize the extent of it, which she has highlighted. Anyhow, over to, basically to her, because she is the one who is uh, under the lens. May, maybe I can request her, how did she first get started? What, what did you, what motivated you to get started on this? Thank you so much. I'm always blown away by your knowledge and your global knowledge of the, the Sikh migration path. Mine is really specific. Mine is specific to to Canada, right? Uh, the path of the very first that migrated from Punjab 
India to British Columbia specifically. Um, how I first got started was really, it was through our family. In 2006, we were celebrating the 100 year journey of our own Baba Ji Gyan Singh, our forefather, who was the first to settle you know, in Canada. And we have over 400 descendants uh, because of his, his uh, sacrifices. So it started from sort of a selfish reason, right? For us to document you know, our own her heritage and our own family's path here. Um, and then from there, uh, we, I, my husband tapped me on the shoulder and said, well, my grandfather migrated in 1907. So I did the same for the Desange family as well. Now, it was, how I went about some of that research was interviewing, sitting down and just interviewing our family elders. And, um, you know, they're the closest to connection to the past, asking the right questions, sometimes asking the questions over and over again because you may not get an answer in the beginning, and writing it all down, writing it down and listening, and trying to connect the dots. I also tried to understand what was happening in history in Canada at that time. So what are some of the things that were impacting you know, our family? And I learned really quickly that there was some unjust laws that were formed, immigration laws. Um, so, you know, I know you're going to talk a little bit about, you know, why, um, why our people came to Canada, but, you know, understanding the milestones and the timelines helped me understand the impact on humans and empathize with what was happening. I think that's really important. Um, I'm not a professional writer. I'm not a historian. I'm, I'm just a self-taught uh, volunteer. I think we have that in common, right? And you know, that's one thing I, I really, especially with the students in, in the room here, that you can all do this with your own families and, and really sit down you know, with your grandparents and take heed of, of their stories because everybody has a story to tell. And those stories, they formed, formed us and who we are. Um, Karen, can you a little bit, uh, some details or small detail, what was it like for the Sikhs when they first arrived? in British Columbia? Well, there were no welcome wagons to greet them. We know that for sure. We know that um, primarily the, they wanted the, the men, they wanted laborers in Canada. They, the, the men came from Punjab to fill jobs in agriculture, in, in the railways, and also in the sawmills, the lumber industries. They were paid significantly less than non-minority workers. We know this. We know that they were not allowed to assimilate into just regular society. They lived where they worked. They lived in bunk houses. They, um, they, they were told that to get a job and to get a, um, they would need to remove the signs of their sick faith. So they would have to remove their, their turbans. They would have to shave their beards and to look more like Canadians or what people think Canadians look like. And you know you see a lot of that in the early photography, where you know they're clean shaven, and you know that's not how they came, and they had to lose a big part of their identity to be able to survive. And the irony is, they would go to the barber shop, and the barber shops wouldn't serve them. You know, so the, the they would end up going to Japanese barbers or Chinese barbers, and there was sort of an affinity of the marginalized communities because they were all going through the same thing. Um, you know, so like, all of this, I would read about it, and then I would hear it echoed in the voices of um, our elders. So when I say elders, I'm talking about, you know, grandparents who are now 80, 90 years old, who are the children of the very first who migrated. So in many cases, those, those 80, 90 year olds were born in Canada in the 1930s. So my father-in-law, Sarjeet Singh Desaj, is an example of that. It, it took me, a, I've been married for 23 years. It took me, what, you know, uh, 15 years for me to realize that I, we have, I have this treasure trove, you know, a living library sitting at my own kitchen table. And I, how, how you know, what a shame for me to not ask, you know, Dad, what was it like? And he would, no, oh, you'd say, you know, it's okay. It's good. And he would say, you know, yeah, I was the first Punjabi boy in my school. Oh, wow, okay, let's ask a little bit more about that. But then I found out they were the first of the first five Punjabi families in all of New Westminster, BC. 
you know, and you know, and then I would take this data, confirm it with the heritage museums. They would validate. You know, you have to validate. We know all all of our findings, and uh, you know, and that's that's really rich history. So that, that's selfish, right? So again, that's for me, for our family. You know, it's for our children's legacy for them to understand. But what about everybody else? What about all the other first time, long time pioneer families? who may not have a Karen, right? Um, so I took on the responsibility of writing stories for 32 other families, multi-generational stories, following the first settler all the way through to present time. Like, you know, how many generations is this family now and what was their contribution? Not just, that's great, they were successful and they became this and that. What did they give back, you know? And every single family had a common thread of legacy of contribution, seva, giving. That is when this work that I have been doing turned to seva, because it was not for the benefit of my family. And my sister, Viljandir, is, is right here. She's on the trek with me. Also inspired a lot of this work, early stages with me, helped document her own family story as well. Um, that's for us, right? But when it turns to service for someone else, that's when it, it becomes myth. Right? Uh, can you describe a little bit the role of Gurdwara, which was one of the first Gurdwaras in the North America? Yeah, so the first Gurdwara in North America was at West Second Avenue in Vancouver. First of all, we have to understand that I you know, talked about you know, the income that the sawmill workers were making. Part of that income was sent back to India, we know, to support the families back home, big part of it. And then we know that they actually pooled their money to help establish the very first godwaras in the community. You know, they built the godwaras. They physically built the godwaras. They would take lumber from, leftover lumber from the mills, carry it on their backs to establish these godwaras, right? They, and then the, the role that the godwara played, you know, obviously, you know, it was for them a sign where they could practice their faith, which was a big part, uh, you know, as we know. But it also became a place of community and a place where they would welcome new immigrant families who didn't have a home, who could stay at the Godwaras, eat at the Godwaras for as long as they needed to get up on their feet. Um, it became uh, a place where they would get news from back home because there was no other way, there was no internet, there was no uh, newspapers. They would go to the Godwara and find out <coughs> what, was, you know, what, what was happening and stay connected to you know, everything that was going around Indian independence, you know, at that time, they used the Godwaras to rally, to mobilize. They used the Godwaras to figure out how they were going to combat these unjust laws that were happening. And it, it became a qu quite a powerful, you know, beyond the things that we already know that are so important about our Godwaras, they were a lifeline for our early settlers. I think, uh Talking of Gurdwaras, my own experience has been fantastic because it's a very unique institution that Sikhs have. And for example, in Europe, there is a 200,000 Sikhs and there are more than 100 Gurdwaras. So just for 20,000 people, one Gurdwara, it's expensive. It's expenses of the place to have a Granthi. So some of the Gurdwaras do not have Granthis even. And people themselves look after the children and the family. There are also places in the world where Gurdwara Nishan Sahib cannot be kept outside. In, in uh, for example, Helsinki, the Gurdwara, you cannot have Nishan Sahib. Yeah. So various difficulties face various people. But Gurdwara and the Langar is a great institution. And I tell you, we were traveling in Europe all over with my wife and uh, we never had lunch anywhere except in the Gurdwara. Yes and always a delicious lunch. Yeah. Can you highlight some of the stories that hit you very much? There was, there was a lot. And um, I have to tell I'm you, sure. I'm there, sure. there, there was a lot of sleepless nights. I would discover things that, first of all, I felt upset that I didn't learn any of this history in school, growing up in Canada, being born and raised in Canada. Um, it was never part of our cur curriculum. We heard about all the white settlers and you know, Captain Vancouver, but we never heard about the the immigration, immigrant experience of any uh, of, of our settlers. So that was the first part, and sleepless nights, and 
I would, you know, share these stories with my husband of things that, did you know? And he's like, actually, I didn't, I didn't know that. Um, one thing in particular um, was a photographer named Yujo Chow. He, um, he was the only photographer at the time, in the early 1900s, who would actually photograph minorities. So what, um, you know, our, obviously our people are very big on photographing. They wanted to show the family back home. They arrived, look, we're here, and they wanted to send, send pictures back. So they would go to different photographers and be, be sort of, you know, shoot away. But Yu Jo Chao would photograph everyone, anyone. And so you have, you know, these fabulous photos from the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s. And Mr. Chow probably didn't realize that he was capturing the essence and the spirit of, of, of our people. And, um, and also their, their struggle, you know. Um, and so when Mr. Chow um, retired, he, you know, his, his photography um, studio went to his sons. His sons carried it on for a few years. And um, then they actually burned all the negatives. <laughs> you know, they burned all the negatives. But what was a beautiful thing as I was going through this process and sitting down with these families, they saved all of these artifacts. They saved Babaji and Biji's passports. They saved their stubs from the ships, right? And they would, you know, dust off these photo albums and go, I don't know if this is if this is worth anything or if this is anything meaningful to you, but this is, you know, you know, this is the this is the receipt of the money that Babaji used to send back home, you know, and we're talking dollars and cents, right? And uh, he, I, we've kept all the receipts. And it's just what that meant, what that symbolized, right? And, um, you know, and then they would dust off Yu Cho Chao photos, which I know were Yu Cho Chao originals because of the sets and the backdrops. I could tell exactly what time, what era. And it was almost like a precious stamp that you're collecting. And so I would, I would take everything, they were so gracious to let me take things, scan them. And so you mentioned this yesterday, that my book is not just, you know, sort of lengthy, you know, multi-generational stories, but there's a lot of visuals, right? It's These are visual stories and, you know, being able to see the people, being able to see the sadness in some of the women's eyes, you know. Um, and I know we're going to talk a little bit, bit about, about, you know, the, the Pioneer Corps experience, but you know, to me, that was really um, profound, um, you know, sort of just really a visual depiction of, you know, the migration path and what, what it must have been like. Um, it, was, it was stunning. Uh, thank you. Uh, just going back a little bit on Gurdwara, I want to give an example of uh, Gurdwara in Stockholm, Sweden. It is their very small population of Sikhs in the area. It's a beautifully located and beautiful Gurdwara, and it's locked all the time, yeah. everyone is given a key. They can go there and matha teko, whosoever wants to do it. And one family goes every evening to beat some dokna and agle din svere What a what an innovation, that sort of a thing. Uh, tell me you know, some uh, experiences of the Sikh women. Yeah, so the, uh, the, in the book I call them sort of the pioneer cores. So, you know, we know that the Canadian government definitely wanted, you know, the, the, the sick men and the laborers. And what happened in that time is there was a familial separation because they didn't want the women and children. They didn't want family, family formation to happen. And they, they just wanted the workers. So what happened is for 10, 15, 20 years, um, the women and children couldn't join. Um, and so, so when I discovered this in my research, and then it made sense to me when I asked, you know, my my father-in-law, well, why did Biji come in 1929 and Papa came in 1907? Well, it made sense, right? You know, part of it was they had to save a lot of money to be able to bring their wives and children out, but there was also barriers to that. And you know, when the women were finally allowed to join uh, their husbands, and when the children were allowed to join. They were told right away that you will need to leave your beautiful saris and dupattas at home. It is absolutely not going to be customary for you to wear that in Canadian society. You're going to need to assimilate. And some of them still brought them, right? They still brought, brought their babies because what do you mean? And so what they would do is they would have they would be forced to burn their 
their clothing. And, uh, and sometimes the husbands would take the clothing to the mill and throw them at the burner. And, and you know, I know, speaking to um, my father-in-law and my mother-in-law, uh, my, my mom, Harbatskor, it was very painful, but they understood. So the women, um, they figured it out. It was practical adaption, is what I called it. So most women in those times wore dresses. And so the women um, wanted to keep their humble uh, style. They would wear longer dresses, similar to what I'm wearing today. But they would also want to, uh, so as a sign of their sick faith, they would keep their dupattas on with their, um, with their long dresses. So you see these pictures of long dresses, dupattas, and they were adapting to Canadian society. And the, the women's role was within the home. The Canadian life became vill like village life in India. They, they made it familiar. They cooked together. They, uh, you know, they helped raise each other's children. They all looked out for each other's families, right? It was a real sense of community. And uh, it's, um, it's a little bit of something we've lost today. Uh, but I feel like events like this and all the work that Vicky Singji, Joshi, um, Gurpreet Korji, you're doing is bringing back that sense of community that was missing. That's the, the savor that you're doing. Um, so yeah, that's that spoke to me. Uh, very interesting because a similar story in uh, Mexico, uh, in, in uh, USA, there is a book, Karen seems to be doing a lot of work. There's a Karen Leonard who has done a work of Mexican Sikh connection. And this book is about how if a white woman married a Sikh or an Indian, she will lose citizenship. So they married Mexicans. So unfortunately, there was no opportunity of that type in Canada. Anyhow, how does your research, how do your children or other younger people think about your research? Yeah, so quickly, I have a 21-year-old son and an 18-year-old son, so they're like your age, guys, in the back. Um, I don't know if they fully really get it yet, you know, and, and understand the work and the labor and the love that's gone into these stories, but they will one day, right? When they are they have children of their own and they're going to look back and go, wow, look at, look at the history of not just our family, but look at the history of our people. And I you know, hope they have a sense of pride in who they are and where they come from and how difficult it was for those early settlers to, to lay the path for us to rise, to lay the path for me to sit here today, right? It's not lost on me, but I'm, I'm older and wiser, right? Um, and so for me, it's not just about my own children, but it's taking these stories to youth, to students, because that is where these stories will live on, right? Is when these stories become part of curriculum and become taught in classrooms, and we speak about these experiences, and we we learn from these experiences, not just I wrote a book, uh, it's gathering dust. I, I get to come up and speak to you and have the honor of doing that. That's wonderful, but it's really how is the next generation going to benefit from the resiliency of our past? That's that's really what what matters to me the most. You were recently, I believe, in Amritsar, and you presented your book to the Golden Temple Library. What are uh, the impressions you have got as to how it was received? Yeah, so my, my family is also here with us, and uh, like I mentioned, my sister, we went back and we were able to donate uh, the books uh, on behalf of my family, and uh, they were so welcoming, and uh, the chief information officer said, you know, and I was feeling very emotional. You can already tell I'm an emo emotional person just being here, bringing these stories of the Canadian, you know, seats back to India where it all started. There's something very profound for that is, you know, I'm a Punjabi Canadian girl. My ancestral roots are here. We visited our home village in Jandiala and I visited my husband's village in Desanj as well. But then to go to the most sacred place in the world for us to leave that gift behind. Um, you know, it just has made all of this work worthwhile to know that long after I'm gone, people can read the stories of, of our ancestors and learn from them. Um, so, you know, I hope that this inspires all of you to, to take a path, like, you know, pick up that pen, you know, where I left off and do the same. Like, this has been such a soul enriching journey for me, and I, I hope you can feel that, and I hope it inspires you guys to to, to, to do the same.
a tricky question. Yes. Where is your heart? In Punjab or in, in, uh, in Canada? <laughs> Canada? <laughs> That's a good question. I think it's safe to say my heart is in both places. Okay. Right? I'm a, I'm a Punjabi Canadian. You know, this the roots here, the soil was calling me back. Uh, and so it's it's definitely both. As a Canadian born Sikh woman, what does it mean to you to bring these stories back here? Yeah, so exactly what I just said. Uh, it's, you know, I, I won't reiterate that. But I, the biggest thing I feel in my heart is just gratitude. Gratitude for the opportunity. Gratitude for the chance to be given, you know, as a, as a Punjabi woman, a space, a voice to come up here and be the voice of the women that didn't have a voice, right? And uh, like, so I feel a lot of gratitude. Um, I can't say thank you enough, uh, Josh. He's busy back there and he knows how I feel. Can't say thank you to all of you who have been so gracious and uh, so welcoming to me and my sister. We feel like we're part of the Jandigar community and family now. So it's it's been uh, it's been a it's a bucket list. It's a uh, it's, I will never forget this experience of sharing these stories with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.